Hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, talk a little bit today about uh, youth custody and trends within youth custody both in Manitoba and throughout Canada. So many will know that after the advent of the Youth Criminal Justice Act um, many years ago, there was a change in sentencing principles when it comes to youth. Um, that resulted in uh, a reduction of youth being sentenced uh, in custody uh, over a number of years. This precedent continued to build up. We've seen that trend happen across Canada. It's happened maybe a little bit slower uh, in Manitoba, but the trend across Canada is clear and it is sustained that there are less and less youth being sentenced into custody in every province in Canada. In Manitoba, that has resulted in the two youth centers that we have, the Manitoba Youth Center in Winnipeg and the Agassiz Youth Center in Portage Prairie being well below capacity now for many years, for over half a decade. Today at the Agassiz Youth Center in Portage Prairie, it is operating at 27% capacity. I believe that there was 32 youth in custody uh, at, uh, at this moment at Agassiz and the Manitoba Youth Center would be operating at about 31 uh, percent capacity, so well, well below that capacity. At the same time, we have many uh, jurisdictions in Manitoba and certainly in the north uh, which are really uh, in need of justice services. And so on the one hand, in some parts of Manitoba, we have an overcapacity. Um, we have more resources uh, than we need and in other places we have uh, almost no resources and certainly an under um, amount of capacity and so there needs to be a shift in terms of, uh, of what happened. So we have made the decision that the Agassiz Youth Center which is currently operating at 27 percent capacity with 32 youth uh, will close in the months ahead and that those youth will go to the Manitoba Youth Center where there is uh, a good deal of capacity because they are only operating at 31 percent capacity. So that change will happen uh, in the summer. I know that uh, this is anytime you're, you're making these sort of changes it can be difficult for those who are involved in the individual facility uh, at AYC in Portage. I think there's a hundred and nine or so justice staff. About a quarter of them would live in in Winnipeg probably half live in Portage and the others are in, in uh, outside of Portage or outside of Winnipeg. Um, they will all be offered positions within justice, within corrections, and so uh, the opportunity for employment will continue. I think for the city of Portage, my understanding is that the, that land where AYC is located currently will be considered for the new hospital. A new hospital was announced for Portage Prairie um, some time ago. Uh, and they've been looking at what that site location will be, so this will be in consideration uh, for that as well, which of course the hospital is good news for the people of Portage of Prairie, and then the rest of the site, I think there'll be discussions with the, uh, with the city of Portage in terms of how that is developed. So ultimately this is um, a response to uh, what is happening with youth corrections around uh, Canada. Uh, at one point in Manitoba, I think there would have been about 310, 320 youth incarcerated, uh, probably uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Today, that number sits at about, uh, you know, somewhere between 85 and, and 88, uh, and uh, that trend isn't changing. Even with uh, only 88 youth in custody currently, that still puts Manitoba uh, right at the top when it comes to the number of youth in, in, in uh, custody on a per capita basis compared to other provinces in Canada, probably three times the national average. So with a very, very clear trend, um, a decade-long trend in terms of where youth custody is going in Manitoba and in Canada, and the need to provide more resources in northern uh, communities where there are little or, or almost no resources in some cases, um, this was uh, a decision that was not easy, but uh, does make sense in the short uh, and the long term. So with those comments, happy to take your questions. Yeah, I think that you're, you're going to see announcements uh, uh, very shortly about additional capacity that will be added uh, in the north. So remember that you know, even when we move youth from AYC over to MYC in Winnipeg, MYC will still be well below 
its rated capacity. But there are issues in that a number of the, uh, of the youth who would be incarcerated are from the north, and transporting them uh, to the south is, is one issue. But the other issue that happened, Steve, is because there aren't transitional facilities in the north, a lot of those youth serve their entire time uh, at MYC or AYC and don't get the ability to go back into their communities and transition back into the community, which we know has better results. So uh, you will hear of announcements on how we're going to be repurposing those resources into uh, northern uh, communities in, in, in a really short period of time. There are uh, different ways uh, that facilities can, uh, can house youth, uh, open custody, closed custody, uh, certainly the open custody model uh, provides the ability for transitions back into the community. It also allows for more culturally appropriate um, and culturally uh, relevant ways for, for youth, particularly from First Nations, to be able to transition to the community. So we've been working with First Nations partners and other partners over uh, several months, really, in terms of what that might look like, and you'll have more details about that uh, really shortly. Yeah. So um, I've heard about these allegations uh, yesterday, and I know that you've done a, a story on it. And as I indicated yesterday, while I can't speak to any specific allegations, uh, any allegations that are concerning you know, racism or other inappropriate behavior within a correctional facility are, are taken seriously. Uh, so we're certainly aware of those at this point, you know, and we've mentioned that there's you know, training and professional training that goes in to try to avoid those situations, but where those allegations come forward, not only is there a process by which those can be uh, examined, but our department looks at those as well. Minister, given that, that it's also appropriate. Quick follow up. So these are allegations that uh, you know we learned about uh, only recently. Um, they indicated that there are already ways in which uh, these things can be investigated, but there could be other ways as well. But I mean, the department is looking uh, at uh, the allegations uh, that were made. I can't speak to individual allegations as the Minister of Justice, but know that we take them seriously and that any of those allegations are concerning. Bart. You know, I, I, um, the, the vast majority, I don't want to give you the exact number, um, but it's been a problem for a while where we've had youth who are being transported down from northern communities into the youth facilities. And the problem then is because there isn't a place in the north to properly transition them, they end up serving their full sentence at either AYC and MYC, and they don't get that opportunity to go into a, a transitional sort of facility, which you know, can provide that support and that wraparound support before they go back into the community. So we can get to the exact number, because I don't want to uh, be uh, uh, guessing at the number, other than I know that it is, it is the vast majority. Yeah, my understanding is that the general uh, population when it comes to um, uh, to youth both at NYC and AYC is from the north. So what would you attribute the, the trend of seeing through the youth I mean, the trend really started with the advent of the Youth Criminal Justice Act, which you know came in uh, more than a decade ago federally. Uh, and the sentencing principles around the Youth Criminal Justice Act. The Youth Criminal Justice Act it puts a priority on sentencing in terms of rehabilitation, restoration, also recognizing that youth might have diminished uh, uh, responsibility because of their youth when it comes to uh, crimes that they commit. Those are principles that aren't under a provincial legislation. Those are federal pieces of legislation. And you know, back when the 
Youth Criminal Justice Act was brought in, I think that there was much commentary that that would likely significantly reduce the incarceration rate for youth, and that is borne out to be true. I think that it took a little bit longer in Manitoba. We probably started at a higher, at a higher benchmark rate, and we still are higher in terms of incarceration per capita than other provinces. Um, but uh, the trend is clear, and it's not changing uh, under the current uh, laws that we have. Sorry, I missed the last part. Um, I, you know, I'd have to get to the exact number of the operating budget. There's 109 staff that are uh, justice staff. There are other staff that come in from other departments, like health, for example. So some of those might be shared costs uh, within health. Um, but obviously, it's, it's several million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're going to, uh, you know, you'll learn more about how we're going to repurpose some of that money in, uh, in the next very short time. Um, I think you'll hear more about that tomorrow, to be more specific. But also um, when it comes to, you know, the broader operational dollars, recognizing that it's going to continue to operate till at least uh, the middle of July or so, um, you know, won't perfectly fit within one budget year to the next. But uh, you'll hear more tomorrow about how some of those dollars will be repurposed. Yeah, yeah. There, there have been discussions with uh, members of the government and uh, and elected officials at Portage, uh, La Prairie. I mean, listen, I don't want to underestimate it. Any kind of change in in a facility uh, in a community can be difficult. It, it helps, I think, a little bit that there are there are other good things that are happening. The new hospital in in Portage uh, will employ significantly more uh, folks than uh, that are currently employed at AYC, but it's not a direct correlation and those jobs aren't, uh, aren't transferable within, uh, within the city itself. Um, there will be jobs offered for all those at AYC in the justice system that will be similar to the jobs that they have now, but they might be at, you know, in Headingley uh, or at the Women's Correctional Centre. So, uh, but there is really good news for, for the city of Portage and I think that that, that land is, uh, is important land and could be used for development in other ways beyond the, the hospital. So. Uh, don't want to underestimate the impact uh, on the city uh, of Portage, but also uh, we were getting to a place where the facility was almost closing itself. I mean, when you have 30, 30 youth um, in a facility and you have 109 staff, uh, it uh, was just becoming uh, you know, very, very difficult to, to operate in that way. And then when you have communities in the north who have uh, virtually no resources, uh, it, it just didn't make sense. That doesn't make it easier, of course, for the actual community that's impacted, but when you look at it from a broader perspective, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it's something that had to be done. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there'll be a transitional plan that's, that's put in place. I mean, one of the reasons that MYC was chosen to remain open is, you know, they have, a, I think, a small youth court that's attached to it, so that has some benefits. There are, you know, lots of spiritual programs that are already engaged in those facilities or other services that are located in Winnipeg that are used. So it, it you know, it made sense from that, that perspective. But even at MYC, I mean, there have been parts of, the, of the, the jail that haven't been or the Youth Correctional Center that haven't been used uh, extensively for a long time because they're way below capacity. They've been well below 50% capacity for a long time as well. So we'll just have to ensure that those are, you know, sort of re-engaged uh, and, uh, and, and modified probably slightly because they haven't been used for, for quite a while because there have been both those facilities have been less than 50% capacity for a long time. Well, I, yeah, I mean, some of those would have been discussions between, you know, the city and, and the province in terms of, you know, how they want to use the infrastructure on, uh, on Keniston. And there might be, you know, really, really long-term plans for Keniston, but uh, they're not in, in, in the immediate or the medium term. Uh, so at this point, you know, when it looks at youth custody, this makes the most sense. But remember, I mean, if this trend continues, if we were to hit the national average when it comes to youth in custody, and I'm not suggesting we will, but if the trend continue and we were at the national average, we might have 30 or 40 youth in, in custody and then, and then we might be looking at, you know, a, a different model entirely. Um, but what's clear right now is that this trend isn't changing and I don't see anything 
uh, federally that indicates that sentencing principles under the Youth Criminal Justice Act are going to change either. So um, then you have the reality of two facilities are well under capacity uh, and areas of northern Manitoba who have essentially no capacity. So that's why the decision had to be made. Okay? Sure. Well, I mean, I think when it comes to the conflict uh, of interest legislation, and our government has, has strengthened the conflict of interest legislation, um, I think that, you know, MLAs see it as important. I think that MLAs, by and large, and I've said this about all MLAs on all sides of the, of the aisle, I think uh, do their best in ensuring that, uh, that they're in compliance with, uh, with those forms. I think that MLAs do it under, under goodwill. So, you know, there are times, of course, when we see the conflict laws and we go, okay, this either doesn't make sense or it's not strong enough, and we meet with the conflict of interest officer and we decide to make changes to those uh, pieces of, of legislation. But my view is, Bart, that by and large members, I think, uh, always do their best to, to be in compliance with these things. That doesn't mean that uh, whether you're talking about members' allowance or conflict of interest laws or other sorts of things, uh, sometimes people make mistakes. Um, but uh, I think that everybody acts in the best interests and, and goodwill that they have. Uh, you know, I actually don't go and look at anybody else's uh, forms. I, I fill out uh, uh, my forms, and I, I, I don't look at other people's uh, allowances, and I don't look at other people's conflict uh, of interest because I'm uh, just not interested in other, what other people own or what other people declare. So, okay, thanks very much.